on his knees. From that point of his journey into spirituality led him on the quest of evangelization. I have not yet read the book, but I read the reviews. They were phenomenal. My own reflection of the title brought me to the world this very day. The storm, a time of mercy, choices, and hope. Please help me welcome J. Toops. With that kind of introduction, I think I should just turn it over to Frank right now. <laughs> he may do a better job than I am. Um, I'm going to don my glasses as, as I turn 55. I can't see what I have in front of me anymore, so I'm just going to kind of start there. First thing I'd like to do is thank Bishop and all our priests and seminarians and everybody in the Sarah Club today to have me here. Um, I cannot really say how humbling the experience it is just to be here. And Frank asked me to talk about evangelization and how we go about evangelizing the world. And today, in the storm that we exist in, and how do you evangelize? talk about evangelization to people who are living it every day. And so that's my challenge here today is to, is, to, is to talk about that topic with you in a little bit of a different way and maybe lay out some things for us to look at evangelization in a different way. I think everybody today can agree that we are in probably one of the greatest storms mankind has ever known. The world has turned upside down in a lot of places. Truth has become false and false has become true. We kill 25% of unborn babies today <clears throat> in the world. Um, people are unsure of who they are and what they are. Uh, marriage is under attack constantly. But the issue there is, is not so much those falsities that have been named, made true, it's how do we bring hope into the world through evangelization? Because today, what God wants from each of us is to be hopeful the true virtue of hope, the theological virtue of hope. Because if we aren't hopeful in this world today, that is, in a lot of ways, feels so different than it was even 50 years ago when I was a small child, how are we going to bring people into the church? How are we going to bring, bring people to Christ? Despair does not bring people to Christ. Hope brings, brings people to Christ. And so as I talk today, I want to kind of talk a little bit about my personal journey as we do this. And then some things that I think may help each one of us as we go out. And as my wife can tell you, I like to tell stories. Um, now, Frank told me I had 20 minutes. I bartered for an hour and a half. Frank doesn't barter. So he gave me 20 minutes. So I'm in, and you know, a couple of us who know me know it's really quite impossible for me to be concise and it's 20 minutes. So I'll do my best. I mean, if the good bishop would just throw his cake at me when I go over to 20 minutes, I would appreciate it. Um, <laughs> If he does that, make sure you get that on the film. Um, so a couple of things I want to start with is the first, which to me is just a profound statement that should change all of our lives and all of the world. And if we truly believe and live by this, we should be able to evangelize easily in everything we do. And that is just something that I try to reflect on every day to myself. And that is Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And if we come to believe that with all of our heart and soul, it should change everything that we do and every interaction that we have with every person that we meet every day. Um, not long ago, <clears throat> I was up in North Louisiana. I traveled for my work, and I was talking to a good Protestant friend of mine um, who happens to be an associate pastor at a Pentecostal church. And we were sharing faith and talking about scripture and the Bible, and he looked at me and he said, you're not like Catholics, I know. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you talk about Jesus. I said, well, why would not? I said, maybe you don't know a lot of good Catholics. And that, for us, is part of the issue, I think. Not that there aren't a lot of good Catholics out there. But in today's world, we're a little bit afraid to talk about Jesus to friends. Because sometimes when we people look at us and we talk about Jesus, they look at us like we should be somebody weird or different. But really, if we believe that Jesus is our Savior, we should never have fear to talk about Jesus. Part of my research and working on tonight I went on the internet and went into one of the sites where you can do some word counts for Bibles, you know, in the Bible. And the interesting thing I found with, you know, one of the biggest, most popular phrases in the Bible is, be not afraid. Anybody have any idea how many times that appears in the Bible? 
It's very close to 700, yes. Yeah. Now, the, the count I got was 650, so it could be 700, it could be somewhere in that. I'm not gonna, but almost 700 times. And to me, in the evangelization world, if we're gonna evangelize people, we can't be afraid to talk about Jesus to people. We can't be afraid to live it anymore. If, we got, if we're afraid to live our faith in front of the world, how are we going to ever draw people to Christ? Now, that's not to say that we go beat Jesus' name across people's heads, right? But we don't have to say that we name Jesus everywhere we go. But we can do it in the way we live our lives. And we have to live it in a way that demonstrates that. So in my journey, there have been several significant um, situations or things where I know that Jesus has turned my life in a different direction. And so I want to share a couple of those. Because it hasn't been me discovering that on my own. It's been people who have helped direct that for me. Um, one, I want to start with young seminarians. This would be a good thing for you to, to listen to. Um, in that, about 10 years ago, I met a young priest that was at our parish. Um, I won't say his name because he probably would want to be, um, be uh, brought out in front of people when doing this. And we asked him to come to a small men's group. And, you know, after, this was shortly after Hurricane Katrina. And we asked him to teach us how to pray. Because most of us just don't know how to pray. You know? So he taught us the ancient prayer of how to do Lectio Dina. And in that prayer, we were reflecting on the gospel of the day. And I want to share that gospel with you today. And it said, it's John 140, 140 through 41. And the gospel goes, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John follow Je and follow Jesus. He found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. Now what he did in that instance, in the way he changes, is he made us read that and then reflect on it. And read that and reflect on it. And he asked me individually, he said, Jay, what do you see? And in that, in that reflection, what I saw was Andrew running through the streets of Jerusalem, dust flying up around his feet, bursting through his doors to see Simon Peter and announcing, I found the Messiah. He looked at me and said, Jay, maybe that's what you should be doing. Well, up until that point, you know, I live my faith. I do what I can. But I really didn't talk to Jesus, about, to people about Jesus. And it kind of was one of those moments where somebody can have an influence in our lives by saying something simple that draws us to him. He said, if you really believe that Jesus is the Messiah, shouldn't we be bringing that to other people? Shouldn't you be bursting through people's doors with joy and hope and telling them that Jesus and I'm, you know, of course, being the person I was, I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> maybe. Maybe I should, Father. I think, I'll think about it. And then on that path for 10 years, um, I tried many different things. My wife could tell you most of them unsuccessful. And what does uh, Blessed Mother Teresa say, St. Mother Teresa say, is God doesn't expect you to be successful. He just expects you to make effort. So I kept trying failed men's groups and failed men's groups and prayer groups and keep trying and trying until not very successful. And then last year, and I'm not saying I'm successful now, then last year, this time of year, some of my friends who are here know this, um, I had an accident, and Jesus took me off my feet for three weeks. That's the way I look at it. Um, I've dumped, uh, anybody who's ever dealt with boiling crawfish, anybody boil crawfish? I dumped 160 quarts of boiling crawfish water on my feet. Um, it gives you a little bit of an infinitesimal picture of what it might be in hell. <laughs> and if it's just that little infinitesimal picture of that, I sure don't want to go there. So I was off my feet for three weeks, um, which gives you some time to reflect. And as my wife could tell you, I'm not very good at sitting still. Um, so I took some time to reflect, even though trying not to sit still. Um, and out of that reflection came the book. It came, this is what I think Jesus wants me to do. Um, and primarily it's bring hope. We have to bring hope. And in what, we, what I reflected on at that time was the people in our lives who brought us hope. Um, I'm very thankful. I have to be very thankful of those people. And so I want to share some of those things with you and then have you, let you allow you to think about how can we do these things? Because this isn't about me. This is about the people who have impacted our lives. Um, one of the stories I want to share is a friend of mine when I was probably about 26 years old, not living a very good life probably not living a good life at all. Had that moment come to pass where I had to face my maker, it would not have been a pretty moment. 
But my friend at that point had gone off on a religious pilgrimage and came back a different person. I saw him and I'm thinking, hmm, what's wrong with this guy? He's not the same guy that I used to hang out with. Why does he want to do all the things that we used to do? And he sat me down in a very nice and kind and gentle way and said, brother, you need to reform your life. I'm like, mm, no, I'm good. He said, no, you need to go back to church. Now, today, if we try to tell people that, what, what are most people's response to be? They're going to be angry. They're going to look away from us. They're going to, which is exactly initially what I did. I went to church one time and then waited again. He showed up at my house on Sunday morning, knocked on my door. I was still in bed, 10 o'clock. Get up. What? We're going to church. One simple thing we can do is just invite people. Invite how many of us today in this room have members of our family who've fallen away from the church? It doesn't take a lot. You don't have to beat them on the head with it. We can just gently tell them we love them. Come back to church with them. It may be the one little moment that we turn them around. And they may say no, but it may be the one moment in 10 years that they remember and come to you and say, I'm ready, can you help me? I think what we try to do a lot of times when it comes to evangelization is do things in such a complicated way that it's not always effective. St. Therese, the little way, right? St. Therese talks about the way we come become saints is in a little way, in doing the little bitty things each day where we offer our lives to Christ. Evangelization could be the same way. It could be something simple as, I'll use my wife's grandmother as an example, Feeding people. I know a lot of people in here like to cook. Feeding people. She would go out on the street and see when the garbage men came. And she'd bring them food and something cold to drink. These are people that most people don't turn and look at on a daily basis. But they're out there working hard for us so that we can have a certain standard of living. What a way to bring Christ to people by just maybe even a glass of water. You know? So there's things that we can do. The key here is being not afraid. The key here is bringing hope. We cannot have despair in this world. Despair is what has caused the situation we're in. And I don't mean the kind of despair that means depression. I mean the despair that says, I'm turning my back on Christ and turning away from everything that is him and giving up. The answer to despair is the theological virtues, right? Faith, hope, and love. My call is for hope. We have to bring people hope. One more story I'd like to share, and I just kind of want to uh, go through this and, and think about it. Is how, how many of us in this room are grandparents? Almost all of us. I'm a grandparent. I have a beautiful 18-month-old daughter. Um, grandparents, your grandchildren. How many of you worry about your grandchildren in today's world? All of us. I worry about my grandchildren, my grandchild, and I'm sure hopefully we have six children. My children range in age from 26 to 6. So hopefully we'll have you know, a house full of children, grandchildren. I worry about them in this world because the world wants to eat them alive. That's a bold way to say that, but they do. Grandparents, you can have an effect on your children. My two grandmothers taught me the faith all of my life up until their death. You can reach out and touch them in ways that you will be long gone in our Lord's hands and they will remember for the rest of their lives. My grandmother chose, when she'd go to daily mass, to take us to the poorest church parish in town. Why? She said, this is the people that we need to help. You know? It was a small thing, but it was a big thing in impact. And she tried to be kind and gentle to them. She was poor too. You know, but she didn't look at herself as poor because the people that she was going to mass with were more poor than she was. And she would walk home and say, I say, well, Mama, you know, good Cajun, Mama, how do they live? She said, Jay, because she didn't say Jay. She said, Jay, they have everything they need with God. They're very hopeful, joyful people. God will give us everything we need. The key for us is bringing that to people so that they have hope in all they do.